Hi everyone, we are going to get started in a few minutes. We'll just give things a little bit of time for the uh, people to come in. In the meantime, um, please feel free to enjoy look at, looking at us awkwardly sitting here making very calm faces while we wait for you all to join in. Um, today's session is going to be recorded, so um, do keep that one in mind if you decide to ask any questions. I'll just pop myself on mute and we'll start in about maybe one or two more minutes. Okay, well, we might kick things off now then. Um, so welcome everyone to Aspiring Practice Owners. Uh, so this is a collaboration between the GPs in training faculty at the RACGP and the Commonwealth Bank, otherwise known as ComBank. Um, we have two wonderful guests here from ComBank to help us out today as your experts. Um, before we dive into anything, I do just want to do our acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from where each of us is joining this webinar today. I wish to pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, it's one of the fun parts about being a national faculty. We're not sure where everyone joins us from, so it's better to play it safe and say everything rather than just one specific place. Um, so we will be running this webinar through Zoom today, as you know. If you're looking for your control panel, it is located at the bottom of the screen. Sometimes it hides itself, so feel free to just move your mouse around down the bottom there in case it pops back up. And then we're also going to be using the uh, Q&A function today throughout the session. Um, so if I could just get you to jump to the next slide, please, Claudia. Thank you. Um, so you've got the option to click on the Q&A panel there and type in any questions for our, our panel members. Um, please feel free to type them in as soon as you think of them. We'll address all questions at the end of the session. Even if what you've written ends up being answered, still pop it in there just to make sure that we've covered your specific circumstances. Um, and with all that out of the way, I'd like to introduce to you to our wonderful speakers. So I will hand over to Kim to introduce himself and pop himself off of mute. And okay, well, how about we start with you, Claudia? I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself. Wonderful, thanks very much. And good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Claudia Smith. I'm an Associate Director um, within the ComBank Health Team. I've worked for ComBank for over 20 years now and have specialised in the healthcare sector for nine years of those. Um, so I'm part of the National ComBank um, Health Team. Um, and as, as a part of the national team, we specialise in, in dealing with and hand, helping bankers across the country. But it's a pleasure to have everyone um, with us this evening and I'll hand over to Kim. Thanks Claudia um, and I'm Kim McCauley, National Director of ComBank Health. I oversee medical services for the bank arm um, for the strategy and insights. I've been in banking for 35 years and for most of this time as a relationship manager supporting business owners with their finance needs to, to buy and grow businesses. And I've been specialising in health for the last 15 years. So um, before we kick off this evening, I do need to make you aware that to this, tonight's session will cover general information only and you'll need to determine if it's suitable for your individual needs. And tonight, uh, in respect to your CPD points, we'll be exploring the entry options into ownership of a GP practice, whether it be buying into an existing practice or the setup of a new practice and we'll walk you through a simple business plan and get a bit deeper into the financial side of things. So in this webinar, we'll explore the pathway to owning a business and the business skills to be acquired. We start by looking at the pros and cons of three options for buying a practice. We look at a framework for putting your thoughts on a page, a one-page business plan. 
you can then grow this into a more comprehensive business plan if you like. And we look at what purchase price you can afford, how much equity you need, and how much you can borrow. We'll show you how to be ready for the purchase and to obtain finance, who to engage to take the risks out of the acquisition, and how to obtain the finance. And we finish off with the aspects to mitigate the key risks. Please feel free to pop any questions in the chat box throughout the evening as well, and we'll um, attempt to get through them through the session. Um, if not, most definitely address them at the end of the presentation. So you've spent many years studying and developing your clinical skills to become a doctor, and you've made a significant investment into your career. So taking the step from consultant to practice owner is a significant career milestone, which comes with new and exciting challenges, needs and requirements. So setting up or owning a practice or a group of practices is not for the faint hearted. There are so many components of business ownership and especially in a startup environment. Of all the things to consider, you know, where should you start and in what order of importance? What is the best to delegate to your professional advisors? And what would you need to be accountable for yourself? Practice ownership requires leadership skills and business acumen. And in the first instance, it may feel quite overwhelming. But as you look at, um, you know, getting into practice, you initially feel like a bit of a jack of all trades and you're often seeing patients through the day and managing the practice at night. But a way that we can help is to share with you some insights and provide you with the framework to help you as you embark on this very rewarding journey of practice ownership. So first comes the question whether to buy existing or to start up from scratch. And there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to making such a big decision. It really comes down to your individual circumstances, your passion for business development, and your vision for the next stage of your professional careers. Um, regardless of whether you choose to buy an existing practice or start up your own, there are a number of things to consider, including how will you finance your practice ownership? Will you use your own savings, need to borrow, or a combination of both? So let's have a look at some of the options available. We'd like you to meet Dr. Yinny. Yinny is a GP and she'd love to be a practice owner. And the first option Yinny is considering is to buy into an existing practice as a junior partner. So this option will generally be the lowest risk scenario to enter into business as Yinny would be buying a share in the existing practice, typically anywhere between 15 to 50% ownership. An advantage here is that the existing owners will be staying on in the practice. And this provides Uni with a high level of continuity, reliability and consistency of business performance. And existing patients um, will, will be there, um, existing staff and an existing brand. And there's less disruption in this situation to Uni's personal and business career to undertake the acquisition. So generally, there'll be a mechanism to determine the buy-in price as well, such as evaluation. And there are many advantages um, for this scenario to buy in as in a shareholding in an existing practice. But Claudia, but what about the disadvantages? Being a lower risk scenario, uni will have less negotiated position over the price and the terms. Being a junior partner, her voting rights and influence and control will be less than if she had a higher ownership stake. And the brand may not fully represent the direction that Yinny wants to take it um, if she owned the business outright. The existing partners, they become Yinny's business partners. So she'll need to understand any existing risks that are in the business that she'll be looking to take in on when she buys in. Okay, so option number two, um, what if Yinny was to buy an existing practice outright? So this would be 100% ownership. Um, essentially, she'd be paying a price for goodwill for an established patient base and existing cash flows. And purchasing or buying into an existing established practice will provide you with a relatively high degree of investment certainty, which with historical um, financial performance. Yinny can liaise with her accountant to complete a thorough due diligence on the practice's financials to assess its value and future income earning capacity. And as earnings translate to the practice value and therefore purchase price, 
This comprehensive due diligence will ensure Yinny has no surprises and that she does not pay more than the practice is worth. So if she gained adequate legal um, review of even the lease documents is important to ensure the business has a secure premises in which to operate. So there's lots of pros here, Kim, with res in respect to Yinny buying an established practice outright. Yep. Look, it all sounds great, Claudia, but what about the disadvantages? Yinny would be paying for the existing assets. Older practices may have outdated computer systems and inefficient billing or scheduling software. Yinny would also be paying for goodwill. Now, this may mean it's more expensive than setting up her own practice as a startup. There may be staffing or cultural issues that are not evident when Yinny inspects. The patients may have liked the previous owner, and there could be some loss of patients. Will the vendor stay on? Why are they selling? Will they set up a competition and take some of the patients? Yinny may want to rebrand the practice, and this costs money. It may also impact the patients and the staff perception from undertaking such a visible change. Okay, so option number three is she sets up a brand new practice. And this option will generally have the highest risk of the three options for Yinny. However, Yinny feels that building a practice from the ground up could be extremely rewarding. The trade-off of having an established cash flow means that she could build the business her way from the outset. Yinny will need to spend more time to identify an ideal location and knowledge that it will take some time to build the business to its full capacity, which may require additional cash reserves. She's visualised what her practice may look like and what environment she would create for her staff. A startup practice would allow Yinny to establish her ideal workforce and culture. With a practice manager um, as the core member of the team, Yinny can play an active role in recruitment. And a new business will enable Yinny to build the business so that it aligns with her vision from the outset and commence with her preferred billing structure. Yinny will have the opportunity to start with new equipment, new practice and clinical management platforms for efficiency, and that, can, that will focus on patient experience. But no doubt, Kim, you, you, you know some disadvantages that I haven't thought of. Yeah, look, again, it sounds great, but there are disadvantages. Setting up a practice is one of the most challenging tasks that Yinny will face as a practitioner. It requires a greater amount of planning and management. Yinny will be juggling a crossover period of being a consulting practitioner while liaising with contractors and hiring staff. There are licenses, approvals and regulations, federal, state and local. You need to work through these. Growing a patient base and managing cash flow through the startup, attracting and hiring staff. So Claudia, what are some of the other considerations that you should be thinking about? Thanks for that. And regardless of um, whichever option Yinny takes, there are five factors for Yinny to consider to ensure the success of the practice. I'll go through these if you like, Claudia. First of all, you've got the patient. It's the centre of everything that Yinny would do. Post-pandemic, the patient's expectations have changed. Patients are now looking for more digital interactions and communications, including telehealth. Yinny's people or staff, they'll be her most valuable asset, and all businesses are only as good as their people and the culture and the values they hold. And whether the practice manager, nurses, reception staff, or the contracted doctors, even more so in a tightening labour market. The processes and facilities, as a minimum, Yinny's practice will need to meet accreditation requirements. Good processes and facilities will enable efficiencies. And when it comes to governance, well, Yinny can review the RACGP standards for general practice, the fifth edition, and these standards are developed for the purpose of protecting patients from harm by improving the quality and safety of health services. The standards support general practices in identifying and addressing any gaps in their systems and processes. And this report can be obtained from the RACGP website. Products and services, a relevant and quality service offering will ensure delivery of quality of care. And for finances, well, Yinny's practice will need to generate sufficient cash flow to pay expenses, hold cash and maintain reinvestment in facilities to uphold the quality of the practice. And this may be funded from her own equity, or it could be a combination of bank debt as well, or a combination of both. 
like any, um, you too may have many ideas and a vision for your own business. A business plan um, is really, really beneficial. Business plan is essentially the big picture vision on paper and an extremely worthwhile exercise for many reasons. A business plan also doesn't need to be pages long. It can really be achieved on, on one single page. So a one page business plan can bring clarity to all the ideas in your mind and put structure to your thinking. Planning will enable you to make informed decisions and help you identify potential challenges and risks before you embark, embark on the journey. It also demonstrates good business management. So Kim, in regards to a business plan, how often do you think businesses should update their business plan? My, my view, Claudia, is a business plan and financial plan, they should be reviewed at least annually. Um, and this also includes reviewing your personal financial goals. Financial wellbeing, it requires some planning. And to date in the doctor's career, there's been an enormous investment in time and effort in building their clinical skills. But now is the time to build the financial and the business skills as well. A practice needs to operate successfully to create an environment where quality clinical care can be delivered. And for Yinny, a documented business plan that is linked to her strategy and includes how it will be implemented is an effective way for Yinny to measure her progress and increase the likelihood of achieving goals. And having a plan helps to get the team working together towards a common goal. And also gives the team the ability to evaluate their progress and it helps the practice achieve consistency and quality in its operations and to conduct continuous quality improvement. There's a great quote from Benjamin Franklin that if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. We've all heard it, yet we sometimes fail to implement it. And often because we don't know where to start or because we need guidance along the way. We need a guide, a coach or a mentor. And as doctors, you plan your entire life to study and succeed in your professional careers. Now you're here tonight planning how to acquire and operate a business. You're great at the clinical analysis, the reasoning, and you care for people. And these are the hallmarks of successful business operators. Know your personal strengths and your gaps. So we'll start a business plan with a simple format that we call thoughts on a page. So when completing the one page business plan, you should start off with the why. Why do you want to own your own practice? Or maybe you've plans to own a group of practices one day. Is it lifestyle, wealth creation? Do you want to be your own boss? Or do you have an entrepreneurial flair that supports the aspirations of your own operations? What will your company stand for? It may be to create harmony through building a strong team culture that aligns with the quality of care you wish to deliver whilst meeting patient expectations. Yinny will create long-term and short-term objectives on how to achieve the mission statement. Yinny wants to build a patient-driven practice and create harmony with a team delivering a model of care aligned with what patients want. And culture is everything. And Yinny wants to align the values of her team, that's the GPs and the staff, to the target market. Yinny's goals for the practice, they're an extension of her vision, her mission and her priorities. For instance, Yinny views superior patient service as a priority for her practice and she plans to align one of her goals on that objective, a goal that focuses on providing excellent patient service to enhance Yinny's her reputation and her conversion rate. Yinny's given some thought to the billing model of the practice and she's looked at this chart from the ComBank GP Insights report released in February. And this report you can download from our website. This shows that where the GP practices have changed their billing model, the vast majority of practices have seen an uplift in the GP satisfaction, an uplift in revenue, an uplift in profit, and an uplift in staff satisfaction. And with concerns over the MBS not keeping up with rising costs and the difficulty in attracting GPs and staff, this has given Yinny food for thought on her billing model. She's incorporating this information into her thoughts and into her business plan. In general practice, you will of course have a broad skill set and be able to service all types of patients. However, it is helpful to understand your ideal patient. Who would you like to see more of? 
Your target market can also be very broad, such as all patients who live in a regional area. Your regional practice may need to focus on the unique needs of a regional patient base. Once you have identified your target patient base, it is helpful to think about them in a, on a deeper level. What is their typical age? What is important to them? This is going to help um, as you get more strategic in refining your value proposition. What value will you bring to your target patient base? Does your value proposition focus on convenience for your target market, quality of care, value for money, or is it technology? Key aspects for promotion are how will you best reach your target market? How will patients know about you? How does your ideal customer base like to be contacted? And how do you best promote to this type of customer? We know care and being with patients is the most important thing. And the RACGP website is a great place to start as there are rules around marketing and promotion for a GP practice. And working through the questions raised by each of the five Ps will help you to plan and review your marketing activities so that you can build and maintain a positive image of your practice. You'll all probably be familiar with the SWOT analysis. Um, and this analysis is uh, a really valuable exercise. So to analyze your strengths, weaknesses, your opportunities and threats. This analysis will help you to leverage your strengths, leverage any opportunities, whilst working on your weaknesses and mitigating those risks or threats. Now, there's four boxes we haven't yet covered on the plan, and these are all financial aspects. And it's not possible to complete these sections until Guinea has a business identified. Guinea wants to be purchase and finance ready. Does she have all the pieces together ready to move quickly? Being purchase and finance ready means that Guinea is ready if an opportunity presents itself, and she'll have an understanding of what she's looking for and have had discussions with her bank, her accountant and her lawyer, and she'll also have her tax returns up to date and no overdue taxes. Unfortunately, we often see business owners rushing at the last minute to complete a purchase. They're not sure what entity to own the asset. Should it be a partnership, unit trust, family trust or company? And this may mean they have rushed a settlement and they create tax complications for themselves in the future. Or they may have had a lease to occupy the premises. They didn't have the time to go through some of the clauses and the rights that they could have otherwise negotiated with the landlord. Yinny begins by surrounding herself with a team of professionals. This will ensure a smooth transition for buying and running her practice. It'll also assist her to identify and mitigate risks along the way. An ideal position is where Yinny's professional advisors work collaboratively so she can focus on what she does best. We encourage you to engage your professional advisors early and this way you can hit the ground running and act promptly when an opportunity presents itself. Your accountant will ensure you have the correct corporate structure and tax advice. They will assist with preparing any financial forecasts. Your financier will confirm how much you can borrow and how much equity you may need. You can obtain pre-approval confirmation of your acquisition as well as provide, be provided with data-driven industry insights that assist with your decision-making. Your lawyer will review contracts, including the purchase contract, the lease, legal structures, shareholder or partnership agreements. Your wills and estate planning should reflect this acquisition and changes that may be being made. Consultants can also assist to set up a new practice and again, the bank will use documents from the accountant and lawyer for the finance application. Your bank will also assist you set up payments and claim solutions that, um, and even business banking platforms that you may require. For your setup costs, take a big picture look at your financial forecast. Start by identifying which costs will be one off and which will occur monthly, quarterly and annually. And this projection will help you better manage and set up your budget and organise your cash flow from the outset. By giving careful consideration to all of your startup costs, you'll ensure you've made allowance to fully fund the new practice. 
On screen, we show the RACGP profit and loss statement and balance sheet for preparing financial forecasts. The profit and loss is where you'll work out the income and expenses for the practice. Businesses usually prepare financial forecasts for the next 12 months. And if you're setting up a practice, we suggest preparing forecasts for the next three years, as it will take a number of years for the practice to fully trade up. If your practice is a startup, we suggest this be prepared as monthly forecasts. And this is because you'll commence with a lower number of doctors and patients and gradually build up. And the monthly projections will show you what the loss is each month. What assist, and this will assist you to understand how much cash you'll need to cover the practice until it breaks even. Billings are paid to the GP and the practice receives a service fee. And this needs to be processed correctly so not to be exposed to payroll tax risk. If you're buying into a practice as a minority shareholder or buying an established practice, you'll be able to obtain from the existing owner their profit and loss and maybe their balance sheet. And you'd closely examine these as part of your due diligence to assess the financial performance of the business and whether the purchase price you're paying is reasonable. And it's best to speak to your accountant on this. The balance sheet shows the assets and liabilities of the business. And for a startup business, the balance sheet assists you to identify the assets you require for the new practice and how you'll fund those assets. Where buying an existing practice, a great way to prepare forecasts is to show the prior years in the first column and then extrapolate future years in the subsequent columns. If possible, we recommend building financial KPIs into your forecasts so you can closely monitor the practice financial performance. Yinni is elected to buy an established practice. The vendors are looking to move towards semi-retirement and they've given Yinni the option of buying one third interest now or acquiring 100% and retaining them on as GPs. Yinni's not sure yet which way she wants to go so she's asked us to explore both options with you tonight. And she's received the financials and she's created this simple spreadsheet to measure the financials year on year and calculate key ratios. Section one comprises the PMS data on the billings. Section two in green shows the accountant prepared financials. Total sales have been increasing year on year, which is a good sign, however, it can be seen that the PMS report the gross billings are stable and the service fee has reduced from 35.9% to 27.9%. And this is a concern for Yinni. Yinni observes the registrar income has been rising. And Yinni mentioned to us she wants to get behind these numbers and plans to discuss with the vendor. And the expenses are fairly constant over the last three years, except for the rise in payments to the registrars. As Guinea seeks finance, she has a number of questions. She's wondering how much she can, can she borrow, how much should she pay for this practice, and how will she know what it is worth? All banks need to meet responsible lending obligations under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. Banks must make reasonable inquiries and steps to confirm a consumer's financial situation and ability to service their loan with an adequate interest rate buffer. In case of an environment where interest rate rises um, are seen, such as what we have experienced in the last few months. A bank will review the business's net profit before tax and adjust to an EBITDA figure, earnings before interest, tax and depreciation. If three years financials are available, a three-year average may be taken and then adjusted for any abnormal um, throughout this time. And this may look like um, the downturn through the COVID pandemic. The loan commitments and debt service cover ratio is calculated on actual interest rates to determine the surplus available to meet other commitments. And then a calculation is made loan commitments and DSCR with an interest rate buffer as well again, understanding the surplus um, in that scenario. And, and the DSCR stands for debt service cover ratio. So Uni's agreed on a purchase price that places a valuation on the business of 1.4 million. Uni's not sure how much deposit she wants to put in and the bankers informed Uni she can borrow up to 100% of the purchase price. 
And on this slide, we start by looking firstly at servicing of the business loan. Then on the next slide, we're going to take you to look at the personal commitments. Now the calculations on the screen show a loan to valuation, which we abbreviate as LVR, of 50%, 75% and 100%. Um, and that's based on an interest rate of 6% and a loan term of 15 years is what we've done some calculations. The debt service cover ratio, or the DSCR, var varies from a stronger 5.28 with a LVR of 50% to a weaker 2.64 at an LVR of 100%. We've also calculated an interest rate cover ratio, or ICR, which is based on the same EBITDA, but an interest only loan. And the bank has informed Muni that she can borrow 100% interest only for this leasehold goodwill purchase. The interest only option may be attractive to Yinny because it enables her to use the profits for other purposes. And this may be, for example, to reinvest in the business, pay down her home loan, or to build up some cash reserves. The debt to EBITDA ratio is another key calculation often used by banks. And if we look at the loan to valuation ratio of 100% on this scenario, then the, the ratio for the debt to EBITDA is 3.74. And this is also the purchase price that Yinny is paying for the business. So that really means that Yinny is paying 3.74 times earnings as the purchase price for the business. We've also calculated the sensitivity for Yinny so she can understand what these ratios look like if interest rates rise to 8%. Now on this slide, we'll now look at the servicing on the personal commitment of the guarantors. And the current owners of the of the business is Dr. Jones and Dr. Kumar. And they own 50% each, and it's owned in a unit trust. And these profits are distributed 50% to each party. And each party has different personal circumstances. Now the bank needs to confirm that both Dr. Jones and Dr. Kumar can service their business and personal loan repayments, their living expenses and other commitments when they provide them a loan. And Dr. Jones needs to pay personal tax and he has a home loan and living expenses for two adults. Dr. Kumar, he needs to pay personal tax a business loan, which was used to buy into the practice a few years back, a home loan, um, he's got an investment home loan as well, and there's living expenses for two adults and two children. And both Dr. Jones and Dr. Kumar have additional ideas of what they would like to do in the years ahead. Dr. Jones is looking to put up his super fund and planning to sell his business to retire. Dr. Kumar wants to pay down his home loan for his place of residence, which is not tax deductible. And he also wants to upgrade the home, build some additional wealth creation investments and pay for his two children to go to private schools. The 2021 profits of the business, um, you may recall they were 340,000. Now these will be distributed 50-50 um, to Dr. Jones and Dr. Kumar, 198,000 each. Now in the 2022 year, you may recall that the profits had reduced and this means that they'll receive $170,000 each. Now, we are aware they also will receive um, their own billings on top of this profit distribution from the practice. So if Uni now comes in as a junior partner, the profits are going to be distributed one third to each partner. And if we look at the 2022 year, that becomes $113,000 to each partner. Now, Yinny is going to use her profits to pay her personal tax. Um, she's going to have a business loan to buy into the practice. She's still got some help debt repayments to make. She's got home loan repayments, um, and she's got some personal living expenses. The questions that are in Yinny's mind include what security is required and whether the new loans can be structured in a tax effective way. Borrowing as a minority shareholder, there are two options for how the loan can be funded. Option one is the bank loan to be inside the business. And if we assume a loan 
of 465,000, and that's one third of that purchase price valuation of 1.4 mil. Well, under this scenario, the interest and principal repayments are made using the practice cash flow. The loan appears on the practice balance sheet. The interest expense goes through the practice profit and loss statement. This effectively comes out of the one third profit share that is due to uni. The advantage of this scenario is the loan is secured by the goodwill of the practice. Option two is where the bank loan is provided to uni, who then injects the funds into the business. And the repayments are made by uni from her own income, which will include that profit distribution that she's receiving from the practice. Investments carry different levels of return and everyone has a different view on the return they seek and the risks that they will take on for those returns. Now, when a business is owned within family members, we may have more understanding of the level of the returns and the risk of each family member. But with business partnerships, it's good to understand the risk and the return appetite, appetite of each partner. And this may assist with determining how much debt the partnership or the company together with the partners will want to be taking on. Dr. Jones, for example, may seek medium returns and Dr. Kuma may seek high returns. Dr. Jones may see, seek a low risk appetite and Dr. Kuma may have a medium risk appetite. Now we've got Yini coming into this existing partnership was a one third and she may want to grow her wealth faster than the current owners, and she may be prepared to take on higher risk. And these conversations are best taken um, together um, before an investor comes in to a new partner comes in to try to understand how all partners um, feel on, on risk and returns. Now, banks will apply a risk grade to a business loan. Now, this may be a generic risk grade for smaller loans or an assessed risk rate for larger loans. Now, everyone on this call today, if you haven't had a business loan before, you may have a home loan and banks don't need to do a risk rate on a home loan. But for illustrative purposes, we're showing here that how a bank will do a business risk rate. And we put six risk grade notches on that horizontal bar, one being a low risk to six being a high risk. And if the risk is assessed as one, being to the left of screen, the business is low risk, and it's got a high capacity to make loan repayments. There's a low likelihood that this business is going to default. Now this contrasts to a risk assessed as six to the right of screen, where the business has a high risk and a low capacity to make the loan repayments and a high likelihood of default. Now there's no right and wrong for a risk rate. It depends on your own risk appetite but it's always best to have some buffers um, rather than borrowing on that fifth or sixth risk grade notch. A lower risk will have a lower interest rate and a higher risk, a higher interest rate. And risk grades may improve by items such as the business holding more cash in bank accounts, the business amortising its bank loans or repaying down its bank loans, the government increasing the MBS more than inflation, thereby increasing profits of the industry. And risk grades may weaken with the red arrows by items such as a reduction in business profits, the RBA when it's raising its interest rates, um, or you might be having high GP and staff turnover within your business. When providing finance, the bank will conduct a qualitative and quantitative assessment. A review of your industry, business and management ability are considered. In terms of industry, the GP practices have a favourable industry risk weighting. Is government regulated with reliable income streams from the MBS? The business rating is also favourable. Manageability, management ability is an important aspect the bank considers if the owner and their key staff have sufficient experience to run the business. This needs to be across various 
areas including managing the doctors and staff, operations and finance. Are financial reports accurate and up to date? Is everyone paid on time, including employees, suppliers, tax office and existing commitments? In terms of quantitative, the bank will assess your capacity to repay the proposed loan. This refers to the debt um, service cover ratio or DSCR mentioned earlier. The bank will assess the risk that may impact your profits. Does the business generate sufficient cash to meet the business expenses, maintain the quality of plant and equipment, the business loan repayments, and pay a profit to the owners to cover their personal living commitments and household living expenses. In terms of the balance sheet, does the business have adequate liquidity and equity ratios? Leasehold valuations are a function of the EBITDA adjusted for abnormal items. And the value will determine a yield, also known as a capitalization rate for the business. And this will be determined by comparable sales in the market. In the example on screen, we've used the EBITDA of 374,000, which we saw earlier, um, as you need calculated, and we've adopted a capitalization rate of 26.7%. Now this provides a valuation of 1.4 mil. Now should qualify, we are not valuers, um, but we're just using these calculations for illustrative purposes. Drivers of the FME, that's the fair maintainable earnings, or the EBITDA is the same figure in this case, is the profits of the practice. And if the profits of the practice increase, the business value increases. The business value can also increase by reducing the business risks. And if risks are lower, investors or buyers will accept a lower yield. That's rather than a 26.7% return, they may accept a 20% return. Or another way of thinking about this is the multiplier increases from 3.74 times to five times. And this would increase the valuation of your business from 1.4 million to 1.87 million. How do you reduce the risks? You focus back on your business plan, particularly the threats. You can reduce risks with robust procedures, systems and reporting. Now on screen, we've again shown the five factors for a successful practice. These are the risks that a bank focuses on. The industry, the business, the management, and the business using those qualitative assessment and quantitative assessment. And the value is in investors also focus on the same risks. Talking to your bank, accountant and valuer can provide you insights on how you can improve the value of your practice. So what security is typically required to obtain finance? The bank will typically require a charge over the business and the lease if applicable. The bank will also require your personal guarantee as director. Banks will not typically require your house as security, but banks will usually lend up to 100% of the setup or acquisition costs, meaning that a mortgage over your home would not be required. When buying in as a junior partner, minority shareholder, it's not always possible to have your loan structured by the business. So this will be subject to the majority shareholders agreeing to this. A minority shareholder borrowing, um, as, as a borrower, you may have an option of a secured or unsecured loan and cheaper interest rates will apply um, for a secured loan. So there is an option of tying in um, your property for a cheaper interest rate in some cases. Being doctors, you'll be able to relate to this slide on analysing your business performance to improve the performance. And it's a similar step, the process to analysing patient health needs. If I come in as a patient, you'll collect data on me. You may do a blood pressure check, collect the blood sample, you may calculate and send it off for a pathology test do peer benchmarking on me against my age and my historical settings, identify any issues, implement preventative approach, diet or exercise or medication, then follow up to evaluate whether this has made a difference. A doctor spends a lot of time analysing health and keeping up with clinical information, but how much time will you spend analysing your business and the business data? And this is the feedback loop into your business plan and your action plans. 
As a well-performing and profitable business, you have more money to spend on your staff, your facilities, and improving the health outcomes for your patients. So there's six steps to analyzing your data. Collect your data from your PMS and accounting software, as we saw earlier. Calculate your key ratios. We showed earlier what they can look like. Benchmark against industry standards. Identify the areas for improvement in your practice. Implement strategies for the improvement. And then evaluate whether that's uh, made the changes that you're expecting. And then you conduct the cycle again next year or next period, and you can compare the results again. So let's look at some product types. Term loans are repayable over 15 to 20 years, similar to a home loan, fixed rate or variable rate, interest only and principal and interest options available. The purpose may be acquisition, refinance or construction. Working capital is only typically required in startup phases for this sector. But asset finance, it can be a cheap and easy way to finance the fit out of a practice purchase medical plant and equipment, or buy a vehicle. The security will be limited to the equipment financed and a personal guarantee. Significant interest rate disc discounts are also available for energy efficient assets, such as solar, batteries, electric vehicles, and hybrids. Buyback arrangements are also available for assets purchased in the last 12 months. The premises lease may require a cash bond or bank guarantee. A bank guarantee is an undertaking by the bank to pay the landlord a fixed sum in lieu of the tenant lodging a cash bond. In terms of payments, the practice will require a solution that conducts both Medicare and private health claiming for the overseas student private health um, claiming, as well as take a gap payment from the patient. A corporate credit card may be required to enable employees to pay um, some types of business expenses. For smaller loans, streamlined assessment processes are available, which require limited financial information. And this is typically under, um, under the million dollar business lending amount. For larger loans, a bank will typically require key items of financial information, such as those detailed on screen. Financials and tax returns are used to conduct that loan servicing and can be provided by your accountant. Financial forecasts may be needed um, if you intend to make changes to the practice that you're purchasing. A corporate structure may be required for complex structures of three or more entities and personal assets, liabilities and personal tax returns may be required to satisfy those responsible lending requirements. So building your professional uh, advisor network early will make the process of providing information to your bank simple and easy. So in summary, there's no right or wrong decision when it comes to buying into an existing practice or setting up from scratch. Your decision should be based on your personal goals and objectives in life and both can be very successful options to become a practice owner. We recommend seeking early engagement from your professional advisor network to discuss the options that best suit you. So that concludes the formal part of the presentation. We are now happy to have a conversation with everyone in the room uh, with any questions that you may have for us. Lovely, thank you so much, Claudia and Kim. That was really, really insightful. And I imagine there might be a few questions, particularly around the acronyms, as um, members of the RACGP know, there are no shortage of acronyms out there in the world. Um, so while we give people some time to type, we did have a couple of pre-submitted questions that were emailed through to us. Um, so let's have a look. Um, if I want to start my own business, how will the bank determine I can be financially viable in the first few months while I'm setting everything up. Claudia, do you want to go that way or do you want me? I'm happy to answer that one, Kim. Um, in terms of um, applying for finance, uh, well, definitely the bank can have a look at some forecasting with you. Um, for those smaller loans, like under the million dollars, 
um, where we are looking at forecasting for your business. So we can work out um, what your billings might look like in those first few months as things start to ramp up, even forecast what your expenses may look like through that period. Uh, we've got an ability to forecast um, together with the customer. Ideally, you'd have your accountant involved um, in that process for sort of larger practices or for larger finance amounts. Um, it is, you know, preferred that they are accountant prepared forecasts, but sitting down and using even the resources that are available on the RACGP website, you know, that month on month forecasting on what sort of level of billings you expect through the practice, what expenses you expect, you know, through those early sort of periods of time. And you can definitely determine you know, what sort of cash flow you may require as cash reserves through that build up period. But um, this industry is um, you're receiving your funds from, you know, the MBS and from the patient, uh, you know, on at the time of the consult um, or, you know, 24 hours later with processing through MBS. So um, the cash flow uh, requirements uh, are not not like other businesses where you're purchasing stock, say, for example. So very easy to forecast in those first few months of operation. Kim, did you have anything else to add on that point? No, I think you've, you've covered it quite, quite well there. What do you think? Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, the next one's a bit longer. So it says, I've been working in a rural community and I'd like to open a practice in this region one day. Is there something I can do to make sure that my business is sustainable in an area that has a generally lower population than the city? I mean, I'll, I'll, it's some of the um, points that Claudia mentioned in the previous one will apply as well. And that's really, again, um, creating a month-by-month a -month projections of the business. But, in, but I'm imagining in a smaller rural community, um, and if the GP has been working in the area, it's a case of whether to take up full time five days a week um, in the practice or whether it's a case that they could um, continue to work a few days a week in the existing practice where they're working and then be working in this new town or the environment where they're looking to create a new practice. I think that, that something like that is a way to, to de-risk yourself in starting up a practice um, within the rural community. Um, but it would obviously having a look at what the competitors are doing within the town and just be to ensure that the demand is going to be there. But from what we typically see at the moment um, in rural Australia, it's hard getting GPs. So I'd imagine the demand is going to be there um, to set up. Lovely. Did you have anything you wanted to add there, Claudia? Or... Uh, probably just more so um, understanding that target market. Like if that target market is a, a rural type patient base, you know, the demographic of that town may be, you know, more more elderly, um, a more elderly population. Um, they might be more family orientated. So understanding what that patient base, what is important to them, and then structuring, you know, your service delivery around that patient base and and um, what what that patient is expecting, and um, definitely understanding then what the competitors offer in terms of your value proposition. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so earlier, there's the question here, it's um, a bit tricky to get to the point. So I'll touch on one of your points earlier, which was about not needing to put your house up as a security when you are applying for a loan. Um, is that an option that people can do um, if that's something that they want to do? Yeah, definitely. And especially in sort of the under a million dollar space, um, really, really um, strong appetite for that unsecured lending just because of the strength of the sector and um, I guess the the career investment into um, into your craft. Um, definitely 100% LVRs um, without the requirement of any property security. But customers sometimes do um, are seeking that stronger um, stronger risk grade or better interest rate and by tying in property security can in some cases pro well, will provide that residential um, residential interest rate offers. So it's really probably driven um, by pricing rather than what is possible. 
No, oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, um, I hope that answers this person's question. It was a bit confusing, but I, I, I would put my money on saying that that's probably the answer they were hoping for. Um, the last question that I have here um, is when I'm seeking financial information um, from buying into a practice, is there a set forms or templates or resources that I need to fill in as part of that process to prove to the bank or do I just get what they give me is the gist of the question. Yeah, your best sort of step one is to reach out to um, your business banker at your bank um, and hopefully they would have expertise in health similar to ComBank Health, our accredited health bankers. Um, and there are a number of different simplified processes which you know, don't require to provide too much financial information. And that's for those, um, you know, smaller, smaller sort of startup type, you know, um, business lending. Um, for the over sort of 1.5 mil in commercial lending, where there's a little bit more government regulated around risk ratings, a little bit more financial information will be required. Um, not so much a template as such, but your banker will definitely be able to provide you very promptly an email with exactly what would be required for your circumstance, um, because we would not want to re request information that we don't re require from you. It's really a case by case to, um, to assess that application quickly. Yeah, brilliant. And I assume then the, the logical extension with this would be that if the practice is not willing to provide you with that information, you should head for the hills as quickly as possible. It, it can trigger <laughs> some alarming um, alarms, but um, there may be, may be valid reasons for why the information might not be available immediately. Yeah, I'd probably just say on that is that we do understand that GPs coming into practice ownership, it is different when you go into ownership in a business the first time. Um, and so it is different from taking out a home loan, which um, you know, is, is basically a set and forget, forget loan. So setting up a business and going into a business, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of compliance that you do as a, um, a practice owner, which is very different from, from being a clinician. It's the same when taking out um, a business loan at a bank. It's just you, you will need to step your game up a bit to be able to provide that type of information and to be able to um, provide um, fast statements on a quarterly basis and things like that. So these things are just part of what we would expect, but we do understand that early on there's more handholding required to be able to take the, the GP on that journey. Brilliant. No, thank you for that. I think it's um it's good to remind people that they're not on their own during this process. And in fact, I, I strongly suspect we would discourage them from trying to do the whole process on their own because I imagine it's quite easy to get yourself tripped up and trapped um, if you don't have someone keeping an eye on it for you and helping you through that process. Well, it doesn't look like we've had any more questions come in, so I will say that we'll call it there. So a big thank you to both Claudia and Kim for coming along today to share this information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is recorded, so it will be available on demand in the near future. So if there's anything you want to review, you will receive an email letting you know when the recording is available for viewing, um, just in case you want to double check anything. With that all being said, thank you again to Claudia and Kim and have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Harry. Thanks very much. See you soon.